So we're getting quite good in local authorities at prioritizing and raising eligibility criteria. And at times it really does feel, doesn't it, that we're really struggling here to meet demands on services. And I think it's, it's great that we didn't have the only one, but we had one of four, uh, what are you calling yourselves? Strategic police, whatever they are. But when you saw that video and you sort of heard their stories, I'm thinking, we don't need four, we don't need 40, we possibly need 400. And I've almost got this concern now that it's great that the phone's man 24 seven, but it can only be one person. And if we all go out there and do our jobs, that phone will be engaged all the time. And it's a real truth, isn't it? But actually, we are working in times where, <coughs> when we look at these areas, some of the resources that are involved are actually quite thin and quite stretched. And I think often we end up looking a little bit like this, don't we? <laughs> Um, in due deference to our police colleagues, I'd like to tell you another uh, true little story about the police. Uh, this is a genuine exam question. Uh, those of you in the field of mental health, be on alert because you should be able to answer this question. This is a question that's asked after 10 weeks at Hendon Police College. Um, if you pass this exam, you're able to go on, on patrol with an experienced police officer and walk around London. I'm going to need to read off the screen, so please excuse me. Here goes the question. You're on patrol in outer London when an explosion occurs in a gas main in a nearby street. On investigation, you find that a large hole has been blown in the footpath and there's an overturned van nearby. Do I need to change my phone? Inside the van, there you go, there's a strong smell of alcohol. Both occupants, a man and a woman, are injured. And you recognize the woman as the wife of your division inspector who's at present away in the US of A. A passing motorist stops to offer you assistance and you realize that he's a man who's wanted for armed robbery. <laughs> Suddenly a man runs out of a nearby house shouting his wife's expecting a baby and the shock of the explosion has made the birth imminent. Another man is crying for help having been blown into an adjacent canal by the explosion and he cannot swim. Here comes the question, that's just a scenario. <laughs> Bear in mind the provisions of the Mental Health Act describe in a few words what actions you would take. <laughs> All right. This wise officer did this. He thought for a moment, picked up his pen, and he wrote, I'd take off my uniform and mingle with the crowd. <laughs> and on a slightly more serious note, I'd like to suggest that much of what's been spoken about this morning, and certainly the material I'm going to be talking about with you for the next few minutes, is what society's doing. Where society is primitively taking off its uniform and mingling with the crowd and almost pretending it's not going on. We don't hear enough about those stories of trafficking, do we? We don't hear enough about those situations of absolute harm. And we certainly don't hear enough about the issues about financial scamming, particularly of the lonely elderly. But before we get into that, I want to just remind us that um, wonderfully, the CARE Act made it a statutory responsibility for local authorities to try and protect people from financial scamming and financial fraud, section 42. It's one of the few formal duties that locals, local authorities have. And of course, we're here today with the Safeguarding Board, which represents all the organizations working in these areas, health, social care, police, fire, whatever. And uh, they have a responsibility to try and uh, sort out some of the issues that I'm going to be talking to you about. Before I do that, I want to briefly touch on that whole area that we've heard this morning, the first speaker, Des, and others have used that word capacity, mental capacity, a couple of times. And I just want to just pause for a moment and get us to consider some aspects of the Mental Capacity Act. In particular, the realization that the term next of kin is a meaningless term in law unless you die without a will, and then the 1876 law of interstate he does come into effect. Therefore, when you go to a hospital and they say to you, who are you, where do you live? How old are you, what's your date of birth? Who is your next of kin? They always ask that, don't they? The question they really should ask you is, who should we ring up if we kill you? Because you don't have a next of kin in law. It's a meaningless term. And this became a real problem for this gentleman, BC Paul Briggs. He was knocked off his motorbike on the way to work a couple of years ago and ended up in a coma. He was kept alive on life support. There's a picture of him and his wife and his baby daughter. And his wife wanted life support to be switched off. 
However, because she hadn't got a lasting power of attorney, she had to go to court of protection. And after a year, in the December of 2016, the court of protection ruled that life support could be switched off. On the day of that decision, the official solicitor appealed that decision because you can't, in current law, allow for voluntary euthanasia. And the news broke about this decision. I did eight live radio interviews on that day. <coughs> and the majority of people phoning in were saying, why could she, as the next of kin, not say what she wanted to happen to her husband? Does that make sense? She was the wife. Why could she not say? And I kept saying, because there was no such thing as next of kin. And da, 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 da. Now, we are all experts in safeguarding, I'm assuming, in this room. Reasonable assumption? Otherwise, you wouldn't come and listen to all this all day. Next question. How many of us in this room personally have our own lasting power of attorney, health and welfare for ourselves? Hands up. Three, four. I don't know quite how many people in this room. Should we say 200? So four people out of 200 have bothered to register a lasting power of attorney, health and welfare. And we are the experts. So if, unfortunately, there is a car crash, or somebody has a stroke, or some other form of brain injury, and you're lying there, unconscious, your loved ones cannot legally act on your behalf. If you do nothing today, and there's been an awful lot of, my things have got, I put my papers there. <laughs> They're so efficient, someone's just whipped them. Um, um, downstairs, my team have got a stand, and we've got all of our materials, and here's the materials on next of kin and decision-making authorities. I got so frustrated I wrote the National Guidance on this after that radio program, the National Mental Capacity Forum. Take this home and have a little look at it. And please consider getting your own lasting power of attorney, health and welfare and finance. Yeah. And I remind you also, I won't ask you for hands up, but how many of us in this room have children who are over 18? Lots. Don't have to be hands up. Can you imagine what would happen if your child, who's over 18, because they're still our children, had a catastrophic, catastrophic brain injury, or ended up on a life support machine, and you had to go through the same scenario as PC Paul Briggs, because you forgot to persuade your now adult child to get a lasting power of attorney. How would you feel? No. So, there's the details on that. You then probably, some of you saw the case recently of a lady who was kept alive on a life support machine for 13 months, despite having an advanced decision to refuse treatment that was given to the hospital, but the hospital lost it. 13 months later, the GP was involved. The GP said, I know this lady's got an ADRT because I've seen it. And they found it. And they switched off the life support machine they had to pay £45,000 compensation to the family for keeping her alive against her legal wishes. Um, and of course the NHS had 13 months of intensive care, life support care, for an elderly person who didn't want to be kept alive despite having an ADRT. I got some incense about that, but I read the guidance on ADRTs that was launched at the Royal College of GPs recently to remind people of the importance of these sorts of things in managing these complex and difficult areas. These are personal things, these are our own families and our own neighbours, as well as national issues. So just have a little look at that for, before we go. Lord Justice Mundy was the person who coined this term um, unwise decisions. The idea that so long as I have mental capacity, I should be able to make an unwise decision. So if I want to take my pension and buy a Lamborghini, that might be foolish. It's an unwise decision, but no one should stop me from doing it. I'd like to suggest that there's a group of people in our society who are in what I call the mental capacity gap. These are people who will probably pass for any form of mental capacity test 
but are often older, lonely people in the early onset of cognitive decline and dementia who will not remember that when somebody phoned them last week for a donation, or the week before, or the week before, that they made a donation, or when somebody phones them every week to make a product sale, to sell something to them, they won't realize they've already bought the product, does that make sense? My mother was in this situation. She bought three and a half thousand pounds worth of vitamins and vitamin supplements in 12 days from one vitamin company. There was enough vitamin D that in her house to have killed the whole street. And so although we often talk about financial fraud being about criminal activity, and I'm going to look at that in a minute, the first point I'd like to make is that criminal activity can often be, I'm going to go up slides one way around, um, legal companies acting in what I describe as an illegal way. I'm going to talk later on about these things called suckers lists, but I'd like to talk first of all about informal suckers lists. These are the list of every sales company or organization that's trying to raise donations. They have little lists on a Friday, so if you've got to make a sales target, they'll ring up your mother, they'll ring up your grandmother, they'll ring up your auntie, and they'll keep going there to hit their sales targets because that's how they'll get the bonus. Not illegal. The person officially has enough capacity to pass the mental capacity test, but thousands of pounds disappear in those ways. This little leaflet was the All Party Parliamentary Guide report that was launched in Parliament uh, a few months ago. It's available downstairs. I think we didn't have time to put them on your seat, so if you want to get copies of that, this is kind of the definitive guide of all we know about all the sorts of scamming that I'm going to be talking about in the next few minutes with you. Okay. <coughs> we state that there are 300,000 names on suckers lists. I prefer to call them victims lists. There are more, but the truth is that more than 300,000 sit on computer hard drives and just like the human trafficking team is only a few people, the national scams team is only 14 people, and they don't have the resource to drill down and take off the extra names. And actually, what do you do when you end up with more and more and more names? But these names are traded on the dark internet by criminals and criminal gangs, and they are predominantly the lonely and the elderly and I'm going to keep calling them vulnerable people in your communities. It's you know, typical what you do, don't you, when you get the list. I sat there, put in my own postcode, my own address, and started to look at which of my neighbours were on these lists. Lists of people for whom criminals actively target because they know they can make a sale, get a donation, rip them off because they are lonely vulnerable and often in the early stages of cognitive decline. Now, we've now made it illegal, unless somebody actively opts in and allows this to happen, for this data to be sold and transferred between organisations. It was tragic that, in my view, that up to a few years ago, many charities were selling their donor base and their databases to marketing companies and then these marketing companies were selling on and very quickly it was getting into the hands of criminals. They tarp the lists up and all of a sudden that's where you've got your list from. So it is getting more difficult for them to do it, but how will we stop international calls and also will criminals disobey, disobey the law, uh, obey the law? <laughs> Sorry, they disobey, aren't they? They just don't care. Why don't they care? It was fascinating to hear how many years somebody got for a tariff to go into prison for human trafficking. A case a couple of years ago of a paid carer. This is a lady who was working for an agency as a domiciliary care worker for the elderly. She conned £235,000 out of a 91-year-old gentleman who was blind, bought a house, bought a car, 
and took on a lot of other duties and spent money on all sorts of things, his total life savings, and only got six years. So it should be out in two. So criminals know that if they work in the field I'm talking about, even if they get caught, the prison tariff is not very high, certainly compared to other crimes. And often if they get caught, the victim will not make a very good witness in court, sometimes will be dead before they even get to court. Does that make sense? So it's just target, target, target. We're not in the world anymore of people so much nicking cars and doing domestic burglary, actively targeting your elderly, lonely citizens, neighbours, relatives and friends. So let's think about a few areas of specific scamming. Before we think about the main areas of scamming, I'd like to ask this question to you all. Is it a scam or a crime to charge differential prices for the same product or service. So if I offer you to do something or sell you something for 50 quid, but offer to sell that same service or product to your elderly neighbour for 500 quid, because I think I'll get away with it, is that a crime? It should be, but it's not. Because we're still in the world of contempt or buy beware, aren't we? And so we get into this really woolly area, don't we? Where lots of people know, rather than trying to sell things to you or get donations from you, let's go to those lonely, elderly, vulnerable people because I can 10 times, 100 times the price and get away with it. Really, a crime hasn't even been committed. Postal scams, these are predominantly lotteries. Sometimes they're like a demand for a tax return, or these sorts of things, but they're the sort of thing that you read and says, you've probably had some of them yourself. You have won 20,000 pounds. At the bottom, it might make it very clear that you haven't won 20,000 pounds. It's a lottery. Because if you're in the early stages of cognitive decline, you can physically read it you can read it out aloud, but you can't understand what the top and the bottom says and put it together. Does that make sense? That's why I keep saying these people are vulnerable. Some people would prefer to call these groups of people at risk. In the NHS at the moment, they'd rather use the phrase at risk, adults at risk. My view is that these people I'm describing to continually today to you are not just at risk, they are by definition vulnerable. You or I can be at risk because of changes in our personal circumstances, a loss, an illness, a shock. We can be more at risk today, tomorrow, and ever. But if you're in the early stages of cognitive decline, you are just vulnerable, and your cognitive de decline is not going to get better tomorrow, it's only going to get worse. Does that make sense? And these people are just not on our radars. Now, what's really terrifying about this is that, if we go into the sort of horrible stories, I have been and seen a house where a gentleman had three, it's not the of November today, it must be practice time. Um, someone playing the bugle out there. <laughs> um, what's that, just my hearing. Um, into someone's house where he had three garden sheds full of postal tat. Stuff that he bought from mail scams. Yet his desk in his dining room was neat and tiny. This gentleman had so much scam mail once you get over an average of 10 letters a day, I don't know if you know, but the standard post is not allowed to deliver to you because it's too heavy. So we had a personalised delivery service from the Royal Mail of scan mail. And one thing said to him, why are you doing this? This is what he said. The only reason I have to get up in the morning is to wait for the posting to come to deliver the mail to answer the mail because it was his only contact he had with the outside world. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that we will never tackle loan, uh, scamming and financial fraud until as a society we actually deal with loneliness. So much of what's been said this morning 
has been about vulnerability in those people, isn't it? Whether it's a young child, a teenager, or whatever it is, it's about having a vulnerable state where you will do some, you can be groomed into some pretty awful situations of behaviour because of your situation. But what I'm making the point here is that if you are that lonely, you will do some things that you and I would think would be crazy, bizarre, or stupid. But it's better to be scammed than to have no contact with the outside world at all. Scam mail is fortunately on the decrease at the moment. The Royal Mail are now intercepting most of the inter international uh, scam mail that comes in through Heathrow Airport. There are literally um, rooms bigger than this full of scam mail that's been intercepted. Doorstep crime is another type of scamming. Doorstep criminality is where gangs of people will target people in their homes. They will usually use those suckers lists. They will often send gangs ahead to mark up the houses with stickers. They'll put stickers on the doorposts, on the gates, on the fences, and the next gangs will come in knowing that there are vulnerable, lonely, older people in those houses. Start the conversations about the broken tile on the roof or the fence panel. Start to fix the job, and before you know it, the job's become 30,000 pounds. Does that make sense? We're working on, and um, I'm working with Samsung at the moment on some camera technology that will allow you to be anywhere in the world, and it's got very clever uh, facial recognition software, actually the same software that's used on drones for military operations, and it will ping you an image of anybody that approaches your mother's house anywhere in the world on your phone that's a stranger. We'll store that image in the cloud in HD quality for prosecution purposes for the police. Because one of the biggest problems about this doorstep criminality is how do you even know who the person was that committed the crime? Because your mum can't remember. Does that make sense? I think we're going to have to go further and bring some of these cameras inside the houses so that we can actually check out whether the carers are sticking their hands in mum's handbag type scenario. I just want to pause a little moment and reflecting on something I heard this morning. Our work to date has been about financial fraud and crime, working with trading standards, and they're really good at looking at the fact that this is not just a rogue scammer, it's a criminal. And so we've looked at criminality in that sense. I'm old enough and trained long enough ago to remember that in the 1970s, we did not talk about child abuse or child sexual, ex sexual exploitation. Does anyone remember what we called it prior to 1979? A non-accidental injury. I'm the generation that was trained in looking out for NAIs. And we started to use the term child abuse around 79, 80. We then started to understand something more about child sexual abuse and then child emotion abuse. So 40 years on, when you hear Des this morning, we're still trying to catch up, but we understand a little bit more about it. Does that make sense? And actually, there are quite a lot, maybe not enough, but quite a lot of resources going into that arena. So if you look at police forces, they have quite a lot of officers involved in child sexual abuse, exploitation gangs and that sort of thing. I think we're moving from criminality in scamming to what's going on from what I call crimes from positions of trust. So I spoke yesterday in Leeds to NHS England safeguarding Leeds and one GP was telling me of a situation they had recently where the receptionists in a GP practice were befriending known lonely elderly people who were visiting the GP and two of the uh, patients in that practice had their wills changed three months before they died such that the receptionists became the main beneficiaries of the total estates. So we're moving from criminals to positions of trust and a few weeks ago when I was on BBC TV and Radio 5 my email went mad I had 22 emails within half an hour of the TV programme and the majority of those emails were about families defrauding each other. 
And I think in exactly the same situation where we started off in 1979 talking about an NAI and then child abuse, but it was a lonely old man that was abusing the children, and then our realization that actually a lot of it occurs within the family, the same is happening with financial fraud. And we've got a huge journey to travel on before we really understand the depth of this. This is a, a graph of phone crime. So many of you will have telephone calls. Yeah. Can I get onto your PC? Your password's being done in or whatever, and you get sick to death of them. Um, the, you can't really read it, it doesn't matter. But the, that's, that's us, ordinary people. Sorry, that's us, ordinary people. This is vulnerable older people. Can you see how the criminals know how to target the vulnerable and the elderly more with their phone calls? But can you see it is coming down? So the good news is, if I'm talking about just criminal, criminal fraud, <coughs> phone crime and male crime is coming down. So what's the bad news? The bad news is there's a doubling in the last two years <coughs> of reported crimes for the over 60s. And as we've had before, we know there's a huge underreporting in the number of crimes. So 50,000 crimes reported in a year. Well, if we have estimate that only 10% of crimes are reported, that's probably half a million a year going on. But the biggest increase is around internet fraud. And yesterday, if you read in the paper, Lloyds Bank are describing how they're getting rid of 6,000 new staff to replace them with a new version of staff that are digital technology people because they want to close down all the bank branches and have us more work online. And criminals know that, don't they? And so they're targeting online fraud. And we are about to see a huge explosion of online fraud, in my view, in this country, targeting, again, those lonely older people who perhaps have never been online before in their lives, but they cannot get access to a bank anywhere because they've all closed, and there's no buses to get to the next bank in the next town because they've all stopped. So you have to go online, and that's where the targets are going to be. So much so that we're in the process of writing some new guidance on cyber internet security and crime. That's the current one. That's available downstairs. All of the materials I'm talking about today are available downstairs. I'm not quite sure, to be honest with you, how all of you in the lunch hour can go to get to the store and get all of this. But please take it, because I don't want to take it back in the car. And it's all there for you. Um, but hopefully that point's been made, yeah? Internet fraud is going to take off. I am working with the banks as fast as I can to try and remind them that, in my view, but well, they, they also have a view of the Financial Conduct Authority to protect vulnerable people, that they have a statutory duty, or at least a duty, to protect people as they move more and more online. Does that make sense? If the force is online, so, so they should do that. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware that it's trading standards that are responsible for investigation, prosecution, and arresting of financial crime. Yet, within the last 10 years, the country's spend on trading standards has roughly halved. And the number of prosecutions per, per local authority rests at around one person per local authority per year. One of the problems that we have is that some local authorities' trading standards budgets are so small, £200,000, that if somebody is suspected of financial crime and fraud, and they're caught, the local authority has to make a pretty difficult decision called, dare we prosecute, because if we lose, it's not the Crown Prosecution Service picking up the tab, it's the local authority, and that might bankrupt the local authority, because it certainly could blow £200,000 budget. And most people in our society, I believe, have a view that you should be innocent until proven guilty, but if you're caught in the act of doing something, you should at least be prosecuted. Most people would not take the understand even that actually a local authority trading standards department is having to make the decision Dare we even prosecute? Because if we lose, the consequence is quite catastrophic. Who's that one in my microphone? 
This is a Trump moment. This is gen another genuine story. You won't believe it, but it is true. It's a genuine radio transcript that was heard between the US Navy ship and the Canadian authorities off the coast of Newfoundland in October 1995. A radio ham was listening on the airways and he heard this and recorded it. Here we go. The Americans were heard to say, please divert your course 15 degrees north to avoid a collision. So the Canadians said, recommend that you divert your course 15 degrees south to avoid a collision. You can tell this is going on. <laughs> so the Americans did, this is a captain of a US Navy ship, and I say again, divert your course. So the Canadians did a, no, I say again, divert your course. Now this is about Trump moment. The Americans came back with, this is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the US Atlantic fleet. It's a nuclear powered aircraft carrier. We're accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers and numerous support vessels. And I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north, that's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of the ship. I'd like to imagine Trump driving this ship. <laughs> so guess what the Canadians said? We're a lighthouse, you're cool. <laughs> a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, supported by numerous vessels with GPS, radar, officers on it, navigators, the whole lot, are driving towards, sailing towards a rock. Not any rock, but a special rock with a lighthouse on it, with a big light saying danger, warning signals, and all the rest of it, demanding that the rock moves, because they must be right. And isn't one of the lessons of this morning that some of the things we've been hearing about, not just my material, but the material earlier on this morning, are things that society is just ignoring and pretending it's not there, and we are sailing and driving towards a rock. Now clearly from my area of interest, it's about elderly people in our communities, and it's about your relatives and my relatives, and my friends and your friends. So I can sort of understand when some people in society aren't that interested, they should be, but I can understand why they're not that interested in, in trafficking, human trafficking, because it's somebody else's problem. And I can sort of just about understand when the stuff that Des talks about, when it's about children, well, it's, they're naughty children, they're not my children. <coughs> they're wrong. Society, we need to be involved and concerned about this. But what I find it incredible is we don't even care about our own loved ones. Only four or five of us have even bothered in this room to get our own lasting powers of attorney. And our own labor, elderly relatives, friends, and neighbors are getting scammed like crazy probably up to the tune of 10 billion pounds a year. Most police forces are on the back foot because they've only got one or two officers in this field. All the services struggling to deal with it because we're, we're still dealing with you know, all the safeguarding implications of the latest child in care type thing. And it's just a rock and we're going to hit it very soon. So we have to start doing things about it. If we don't, they are your relatives and my relatives. They've done it in the scam. West Yorkshire Trading Standards and their little team, not one authority, a group of authorities, they got their four and a half thousand names on the suckers list and they um, visited everybody on that list. Now they reckon that they saved 900,000 pounds in money from being scammed by that group. They did, the, the, the research on this or the data on this is a bit difficult to show or prove. They, they reckon that if 10% of the victims um, didn't go into care a year earlier. So what we know is that many people who were scammed lose the confidence to live alone in their home anymore. Yeah, it's such a violation. It's not just a cash loss; it's the human confidence loss, and they end up in care. Now we don't actually know how many of them do that, but they were trying to work on the basis of 10%, and they reckon that would save the public purse 29 million quid. My team and I are trying to get some better data, but it's very hard in this area of underreportedness to actually track it all down. But the point is, if the elderly in Shropshire lose their life savings, and then they end up in care, who picks up the bill? Adult safeguarding rule, well, it's not the Labour Authority and the Health Authority, isn't it? And so it's not surprising that we're worried about winter vet state pressures and whatever. This is huge. But no one's doing the research on it. 
It's very difficult to get down to these sorts of numbers, so we have these estimated figures, and we don't quite know the scale, but it's probably massive, and it's a big issue. Coming towards the end. Something called the Banking Protocol, Banking Protocol was launched a few years ago. Do you remember seeing and hearing stories of often an elderly lady being escorted to a bank by a youth with a, with a hoodie on and taking out all of her life savings in cash and passing it over to the hooded youth? To try and stop this, something called the Banking Protocol was, was set up. It was piloted in the London Borough of Havering where every bank and building society, all the staff on the, on the desk, the tellers, were all trained. So if there were concerns that someone was being escorted into that branch to take their money out, and they were being a bit unwise, they could pick up the phone, dial 999, and the Met Police agreed to send the Priority A car around to that branch called that building society branch immediately to tackle it. That protocol was rolled out such that in the year up to December 17, which is the latest data I can get, the 42 police forces of Scotland were the last one to join. That's what was missing, 1,343 police forces. 13 million pounds were stopped from walking out of banks to hooded youths in one year. 129 arrests. Now that's great. But I think, what was going on the year before? And the year before, and the year before, before we even started this? If they could stop 13 million quid in a year, that was a lot of money the previous year, wasn't it? These are off the scale in terms of what's going on. So here are some of the resources. Um, we produced this, which is like a learning resource. Uh, we designed it predominantly for healthcare workers. Our working assumption was that probably the main professional that would see the lonely, vulnerable elderly in the community would be the district nurse or the healthcare worker for some associated healthcare problem. Does that make sense? It's not enough training standards officers or policemen and social workers are often not involved in these scenarios. So we produced this training pack, but anyone can use it. Um, and it has got little vignettes, small pieces of learning about different sorts of scams, what to look out for, what to spot, and what to do. So all available downstairs, take it away with you. You can just use it in 10, 15 minute slots in your teams, does that make sense? I think it should be com compulsory training, clearly I would think this would work, um, for all domestic uh, care working agencies and these sorts of things, with me. Those of us that go into people's houses, what to look out for and what to do. And with it, there's four little uh, five, four minute, five minute videos of different sorts of scamming. So there's one on mail scam, one on telephone scam, one on romance scamming. And uh, I'm gonna show one of those uh, this afternoon in our workshop, just one, but you can download them all for free, all that material's there. These are our general advice leaflets, like that. this is the text that Sally, Leanne and I wrote around scamming. That's gone to every chair of every trading, every safeguarding board in the country, to every trading standards team, it's sort of national advice and those sorts of arenas. We have a few copies of those, so if you're quick, you can even have a 20 pound textbook for free. I don't remember how many we brought of those, we bought enough of all that for everybody, we bought about 50 of those. Um, what's interesting, all of this work, by the way, is all funded by charities. Yeah, I can't get any local authority, any health organisation, the NHS or anybody to fund any of this. I have to beg and borrow from charities to give me the money to produce the materials to bring to here to give to you guys. Does that make sense? Well, we're living in. So, some possible good news and reasons for optimism. How much longer have I got? Five minutes? Yep. Yeah. Um, we've got the relaunch of the Joint Force Task Force Vulnerability Group. This was set up by Theresa May a few years ago. Unfortunately, it was chaired by the banks, and therefore for two years nothing happened. Thank you very much. Um, and um, it's now chaired by Louise Batson from the National Scams Team. I will be less than five minutes, thank you. So the lady did give a little back. I think we were very healthy. Um, we've changed the opt-in, opt-out stuff about data sharing, the better use of technology, the banking protocol, and we've got new learning resources. However, the worrying parts are, there's still, underneath, this issue of loneliness and isolation. But banks and financial organisations need to look to stop criminal fraud more than just protect the leaders of the bank, protect the leaders of the 
I mean, there are massive needs for changes in society, in my view, that we can better talk about and prepare for more difficult times. Senior High Court judge said to me after I was speaking at the Law Society, can I take one of these feet? And I said, yeah, we can leave. And to lady, she said, I'm going to stick it on my passenger seat because tonight I'm picking my mum up from the railway station. And when she sits on it and goes, what's this? I'm going to say, oh, it's a thing that someone's written about last year, I was attorney. I think we need to get one. I said, it's very hard to talk to you parents, isn't it? I might be the you know, 50 plus year old professor that does this. When I try to talk to my mother about her money, guess what I got? <laughs> Bugger off, son, it's my money, I'll do with what I like. Yeah. So use these materials to try and drive those sorts of things in. As I've said, the cost to individuals is huge in terms of money, a loss of confidence, a loss of dignity. The cost to society, picking up the consequences, we haven't even thought about the cost in terms of police time, investigation time, training standards time, let alone the cost of care time, and the cost to carers and relatives and victims of those who have a cognitive impairment and scammed. And I want to leave on this final story. My, my mother um, started to have cognitive decline, dementia. She's a very proud northern lady, she died three years ago. I can very well remember the day walking down Highcliffe High Street, which is a little village near Christchurch on the south coast, when my mother went to hold my hand. Now, I don't think I've held my mother's hand that way since I was a child. But when my mum used to hold my hand as a child, she did that to protect me from running into the road, getting knocked down by a car, running off and getting lost, whatever, yeah. A mother held a child's hand, my hand, to protect me because I was vulnerable. My mother never in her life would have ever said she was at risk or vulnerable or anything. But there was a moment when she held my hand on Highcliff High Street because she knew that the dementia was getting to a point in her life where she wasn't always coping. And she held my hand because she needed protecting. And she knew it, but she couldn't articulate it. She didn't even really know what was going on in her life. But she was vulnerable. She was not at risk, she was vulnerable. And it was by mother. And I drive my team quite hard. And sometimes I think I'm a bit of a hard taskmaster. I hope I'm not that hard. Because I am determined that we are going to do something about this. Because I could not stop my mother being conned three and a half thousand pounds of vitamins and a load of other sorts of things, even though I was like a hawk on it. I was looking at her bank account every day, trying to stop scams, but I couldn't always. My mother's funeral was just over three years ago. I've never told this story before. I don't know why I'm telling you today, probably because there's been so much powerful stuff. At my mother's funeral, I stood up there and I said, I am going to do something about scamming in this country. I've been working in this field for a couple of years. I'm not retiring at the moment, even though I want to, because I'm determined to try and sort this problem out as best we can. We have a long way to go. People like you in this room, you are professionals in this field that can make a difference. Even if you're not a professional in this room that can make a difference, and you are, you're citizens that can make a difference. What about your own families? What about your own relatives? What about your own neighbours? Please take this material. If you want more, download it. It's all free. Everything we do, we commit to make free to society to try and stop this terrible scourge. Thank you.